Okay, the next speaker is uh, from University of uh, Southampton, uh, Callum Littlejohns, who's going to talk to us about a completely different topic, uh, open silicon photonics. Thank you, Mike. Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, it's a pleasure to be here, um, both at this event and in Amsterdam, even with the very bad weather, but you know, being British, I'm kind of used to it anyway. So I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so talking about something which is very different. Um, it's an, an initiative we've been running in the UK for several years now, um, called Cornerstone, and as the title of my talk suggests, this is a, an open access silicon photonics research foundry. So, if I've um, gauged the audience well, um, perhaps you're not completely familiar with optics, mostly from an electronics background. So I'll start by giving you know a brief kind of overview about optics and silicon photonics. So I'm sure you're all aware that um, optics really forms the backbone of the communication systems um, globally, dating back to the sort of late 90s and sorry, late 80s and early 90s. Um, but what you may not know is the the erbium doped fiber amplifier, which really makes this type of long haul communication possible, was actually invented at the University of Southampton uh, back in the 80s. So what this chart's supposed to show is that. Over time, the distances to which optics has replaced electronics is getting smaller and smaller. Um, and now, today, we see optics you know, in, in data centers, um, you know, between racks, in racks, and starting to become on, on board. And if you went, um, listen to um, Hans-Jürgen Schmitka's talk yesterday afternoon, he emphasized the need to get photonics you know, closer to the electronic package on chip. So what do we need to actually get, make this happen um, for you know, truly on-chip optical interconnects? Well, I've listed three things there. We need more bandwidth density, so more, more gigabits per second per centimeter squared. We need better power efficiency. And crucially, at the bottom here, it has to be cheaper. So we're all aware, in order for new technologies to be adopted, they have to be better or cheaper than the, the previous technology. So crucially, this bottom line are less dollars per gigabit per second. This is where silicon photonics comes in. So um, without insulting anybody's intelligence, what is silicon photonics? So it's the implementation of photonics using CMOS platform. So this is really the big selling point of the field of silicon photonics. We can use the CMOS infrastructure that's already in place and has been developed over the last several decades. And what this leads to is the low cost aspect. So it's, it's very scalable technology. Um, once you get into mass production, the cost comes down significantly. Um, and so with optics, you can get very complex functionality. So just a little bit more detail about silicon photonics. I've already mentioned the key selling point is the prospect of integrating it with CMOS electronics. Um, and use, by using exactly the same platforms, we can use the same infrastructure. So the volumes involved with silicon photonics at the moment um, are not anything like electronics. It's quite small. So what this means is we can almost use the spare time of the big CMOS fabs to, to run these photonic um, applications. But this means we can use very advanced technology. But crucially, we don't really have to use the best technology because the feature sizes in optics are much bigger than electronics. So typically, the critical dimensions in photonics might be 100 nanometers. Um, so it is possible to use sort of older technology. Um, and that's exactly what we do at university. We don't have the budget for the very best state of the art um, technology, but as I say, it's not, it's not compulsory. Um, and silicon as a material, um, it has a high refractive index contrast with its native oxide. And what this means is your components can be very compact. So we can have very small chips um, relative to sort of other materials like you know, silicon dioxide to air, the, everything's much bigger. Um, and it, 
I've also listed there WDM, so that's wavelength division multiplexing. This is generally for optics. Um, this isn't exclusive to silicon photonics. Uh, we can multiplex several um, signals onto one optical fiber, which obviously increases the bandwidth density massively. And again, I keep emphasizing it, low cost. So just as a summary, really, of silicon photonics, the big strength of the field is that we can make use of CMOS technology. But rather ironically, this is also its weakness in that we must use uh, CMOS technology. Um, so I'm sure you're all aware that there is no light source in silicon, and this is really the major you know, roadblock for the field of silicon photonics. Um, so at present, we have to use external light sources built in a different foundry, and this is the biggest cost by quite a significant margin, is the, is the integration of light sources and the packaging. Typically, the, the silicon photonics chip might be about 10% of the cost of a, of a total package. Um, so, you know, if, once we can bring down these costs, then it will become a much more mass market. So the advantage of CMOS, again, is that we can use the extremely expensive infrastructure that's already in place. We don't need to build it ourselves. And this gives us a lot of sophistication at a very low cost. So that's the field, really. Um, so what is Cornerstone? Now, in, in the spirit of the OCP, it's, um, as far as we know, the really the only truly open source silicon photonics foundry service in, in the world. And what I mean by that is that we don't have any license agreements you have to sign. Everything is open access on our website. So all the components that you can use as a designer, they're all available for you to go and view and change and use as you like. Um, so this is kind of quite different to most foundries where you have big license agreements you have to sign. And being from a university, this is quite often a big problem. So if I jump straight to the highlights of our platform, it's a, we run a, a multi-project wafer service. You know, we've kind of copied the electronics industry here. So what this means is that we release some design rules. And uh, as users, you can submit designs that fit within these design rules. And we build them all together in a big package. So it's really a cost-sharing mechanism. It means that the, the access cost to researchers is massively reduced. Um, in that you don't have to you know, commission an entire wafer just for yourself. You can share it amongst other users as long as you fit within our design rules. So we have various silicon and insulator platforms, which is really the, the, the mainstream photonics platform at the moment. Um, but we offer more than one thickness for different applications and different wavelengths. So at the early stages of the field are mostly focused on telecoms at 1.5 and 1.3 micron wavelength. But now we're seeing um, new emerging technologies for mid-infrared, for sensing, and things like that. So this needs different platforms, and we offer several different ones. Um, so being a research fab, we have a very flexible process, which might be uncommon um, compared to other foundries in that they really target yield, so very high yield. But we have a different approach that we rather people can try new things and be innovative, you know, at this expense slightly of yields. Um, hence why we sit more on the research side. But we have a very unique um, offering in that we have deep UV projection lithography, which is quite uncommon for a university. So what this means is that our technology is scalable. So we use exactly the same technology that the, the mass manufacturing foundries would use. Um, so you have foundries like sat at one end, which can do 5,000 wafers a month. Um, using this type of technology, and then typically right at the other extreme, you'll have the research fabs, which usually would use e-beam lithography. But this, this isn't scalable. So if you come and make a nice new device, then it's not a scalable technology. So we sit right in the middle in that we use all the same processes as the, the very best fabs, meaning that the technology transfer is very straightforward. But crucially, I've already mentioned we don't have the state-of-the-art um, lithography systems. But we do offer like a hybrid process where we can use deep UV lithography for the most of the layers. And for the, the really high resolution layers, we, we do have e-beam lithography as well. So this means we can mimic the, the best, you know, most advanced technology nodes. Um, so for, it's really 
to reduce the cost. We only use E-beam when we really need it for the very high resolution. Um, and because we're in the UK, the costs are very competitive and getting cheaper and cheaper by the day, thanks to Brexit, um, which is good for you guys if you're not from the UK, um, but not so good for us. Um, and also, we have a big team working in this field um, in, in other research projects of about 50 people. So we don't just offer fabrication. We have the potential for design consultancy. We have a characterization lab um, for testing yeah, high-speed components. So that's really the highlights. Um, it's formed of three UK universities. There's us at the University of Southampton, which is on the south coast, kind of just underneath London. Um, uh, we do wafer scale processing on eight inch wafers. There's the University of Glasgow up in Scotland. Um, they run e-beam lithography, so they're more for like the very high risk devices where you might just want to commission one or two chips. Um, and then the third partner is the University of Surrey, um, which is in Guildford, and they're our own implantation partners. So in Southampton, we have a fairly big clean room that has all of the facilities you might expect of a CMOS fab, you know, with the exception of the deep UV, sorry, with the exception of the iron implantation, which is done just up the road at the University of Surrey. So this is just some example devices of the type of thing we can do. Um, this is really mostly our own work, but of course the idea is that you guys submit your own designs and you can do whatever you want within our design rules. So I've just brought a few examples here, the spectrometers, this is for sensing applications, um, for things like lab on a chip, medical applications, defense for sensing gases. Um, typically this is done at longer wavelengths because that's where you see the absorption peaks of you know, gases that are particularly interesting. Um, so this is really just a wave guiding platform. Um, we can add thermal effects, so the thermal optic effect in silicon is very strong, which is, can be good, but can also be a bad thing um, because you have to tune it. But we can use it to our advantage for phase shifters and making you know, tunable processor cores, which I've got a slide on in a minute if I have time. Um, we can also do high-speed modulators, so up to about 50 gigabit a second, something like that. Um, and this works kind of dating back to about 2010, and it's based on carrier depletion. So you put a PN junction across a waveguide, and then the carriers affect the, the phase of the light. So just to give you a bit more in-depth detail about some particular components we've worked on. So this is a, what we call a bi-directional angled MMI, a multi-mode interferometer. And it's a, it's a WDM device for splitting different wavelengths. Uh, for multiplexing. So one of the, the issues with optics is that f um, you really care about phase a lot. So that means tiny fabrication errors um, can be quite uh, disastrous to your, to your um, performance of your device. So you often need things like thermal tuning, which is power hungry, so that's not a good thing. Um, so we've designed a component here which acts both as a transmit and receive side. So we have the input A, which is just a single mode waveguide. It excites several modes in this big long region. And due to the, um, due to the angle that we excite this at, we, you get a wavelength dependence on the, um, on the output point for the, the self-imaging. So in this way, we can split several wavelengths off, but we can actually operate it in both directions. So um, it work, any fabrication errors we see on the transmit side, you get the same thing on the receive side. So you can see from the chart there that the response kind of neatly overlaps. So that's one example device. Um, and this is work from one of our users in the Cornerstone platform. So it's from the University of Valencia in Spain um, on programmable optical circuits. So this is really inspired by the electronic FPGA. Um, in that what we have here is just a, a mesh of ring resonator devices. Um, and by using the thermo optic effect, we can tune the route, we can reroute the light around this mesh in, in any way that we want. Um, and just in this paper, they demonstrated you know, 20 different functionalities, but this is very scalable. We can make a bigger mesh, you can have more functionality. 
So there's a picture there on the right hand side of the screen. It's the wire bonds you'll see is just um, the electronic control system linked into the, the optical PC, the, uh, the PIC. So there's just two examples there. You can see a ring resonator. That's quite obvious based on the structure, but we can also route the light slightly differently to introduce a phase shifter so that you can thermo, thermo optically tune the phase. So finally, uh, modulation, which maybe is the most interesting to the audience um, for telecoms. Uh, this is an O-band modulator, so that's 1.3 micron. Um, this is a typical eye diagram we might see, 56 gigabit second, which is quite common now these days in silicon photonics. Um, this is simple on-off keying, and what we're seeing most recently is more complex modulation mechanisms. So this is just simple on-off, but you might have polarization modulation integrated in together, and by doing that you can increase the, the bandwidth density. You know, we're now starting to package these things together, um, like the, the cartoon shows there. So just, I guess, the take-home message I'm trying to portray here is that if you're interested in silicon photonics, come and talk to us. So thank you for your attention.